So this is a maintainer track talk. Uh, we're both Knative maintainers. If you were expecting something not about Knative or whatever, then you know, go check your sked. But I'm assuming you're all here for us. Uh, so Knative has been released for a little over six years, and we thought it would be a good opportunity to reflect back and see how's the project changed since very early days to very recent days. Yeah, so I'm Callum. I'm one of the newer maintainers in the Knative project. So this talk was also interesting for me since I learned a lot about version 0.1. I joined around 1.7, 1.8. So a lot of the earlier stuff was a cool learning experience for me to go back and look at it. I mostly work in the eventing area, and I'm the lead of the new UX working group that we restarted. And I'm currently in my final year at the University of Toronto, where I do um, engineering science. And I'm Evan Anderson. Uh, I was one of the OG Knative folks um, when it was a project starting at Google before it actually even came out to the public. Uh, I was there busily working on APIs and things like that and compatibility between Google Cloud Run, which shares zero code with the open source Knative project, but shares a compatible API. Um, and since then, I also have been, worked at VMware, and I'm now working on software supply chain security at Stacklock. But I'm also on the Knative steering committee, and I'm still involved with Knative. So I had to look this up. Um, I, was, I was the one who drew sort of the short straw to be answering stuff online when everyone else was partying at Google Cloud Next. Um, and so I just pulled out a couple of the things I remember. So there's the Google blog and Hacker News um, you know, had a bunch of folks chiming in from different areas. And uh, Joe Beta was one of the early folks. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he was one of the original Kubernetes founders um, who chimed in with some takes on, Kubernetes, on Knative that uh, helped you know, direct things after it was out in the public. Um, and the basic vision that we had was, hey, uh, these serverless services and these platform as a service things were great, um, but they all locked you into a very specific vendor, and nobody else, no two companies offered the same API. And uh, if Google was going to, in 2018, launch a new serverless thing, um, it needed some distinguishing characteristic. And what if the characteristic was that you could run it on Kubernetes in your own environment, and it was open source, and you could build it. It was built from different decomposable pieces that you could plug together um, in the way that suited you. So you didn't have to build everything as a function if some things didn't belong as functions. And so that's what Knative was. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of Lambda? Yeah. So one of the things that comes up if you're trying to make Knative into these different building blocks that you can combine is you need to figure out what building blocks do we actually want to have. And so if you look at Lambda, it has, as we listen on the side, you, know, you don't have to do the infrastructure, your management yourself. It's very easy to integrate with different AWS services, and it's got a really simple developer experience. And so some of the key characteristics that people are looking at is there's that huge scaling that Lambda is able to do. And that really maps onto what people were trying to put into Knative serving of scaling your different containers independently. And then also you, you, you want a runtime that basically knows how much load there is and runs enough. And you don't have to think about what enough is. Um, and it reacts on a second by second scale rather than, oh, we had a big spike of load. I noticed it three minutes later and I added some, you know, some more pods. And it's like, well, great, but it's three minutes later, all that load has gone away. So um, you know, if you've looked at Lambda, they can go from zero to 3,000 in like 30 seconds. And so that was, that's kind of what scales infinitely means here. Yeah, and I think crucially doing that without dropping any of the traffic. So all those users still get access to the whatever you're running that's making these requests. The next thing that was important is you can choose how to trigger your Lambdas. And so the next building block was we wanted something where you can say, hey, when this event happens, run my code. And that's sort of independent from scaling your code. And so that led to the eventing building block. Uh, do you want to add anything? Oh, sure. Um, and the last piece that um, we'll see both with Lambda and with Heroku is that um, unlike 
a lot of Kubernetes stuff, which is like, okay, so we start with, you write an application and you write a Docker file, and you figure out how to package all of it. You just say, here's my code, please run it for me in the cloud, I do not care how, uh, which is an old uh, pivotal Cloud Foundry haiku, but that's really the experience you want. Here is my code, please run it for me, I don't care how you do it, just turn it into something that executes. Um, and so if we sk skip forward to Heroku, um, we can see a bunch of similar patterns here. Um, Heroku has a lot more flexibility in what you run than Lambda does. Lambda is like, you are a function and you are this big. And Heroku, you know, you can bring in your web apps and things like that. Um, but it still abstracts away a lot of that infrastructure and gives you that, hey, um, you know, run my code for me. Uh, one of the neat other things that you get with Heroku that Lambda got a lot later is um, you get a host name back. You're like, here's my code. And they're like, here's where you can reach your code. You didn't have to set up any network infrastructure or anything like that. It just happens. Um, and similarly, build packs, there's a CNCF build, build packs project now, grew out of um, the Heroku builds for Dynos, which were their early version of containers, and then their V2 of that, and Cloud Foundry kind of copied that pattern, and then um, everyone said, maybe it'd be better if we had one way to build things than like an uh, ever fractal growing number, and so CNCF build packs kind of standardized that. Yeah, and so when we looked at all these different things, we were able to come up with sort of three big building blocks that we wanted to provide in Knative. The first one was Knative serving, the second one was Knative eventing, and the final one was originally Knative build, which now there's Knative functions filling a similar role. And so the cool thing is you can mix and match these different components how you want. So if you take functions and serving, you get very similar to that um, Heroku experience where you just give it some code and it builds it for you and you get a URL back. We also get all that scaling that you get out of Lambda. Well, I, I'm not sure if Heroku has a lot of fancy scaling stuff. Heroku doesn't, the Heroku scaling is not as fancy as Lambda's, but they still have auto scaling available. Um, and if you wanna go back in time, you can also see that like the original idea of like JBoss and you know, here's a jar that encodes my application, please just you know, run it for me and I don't wanna worry about any of the infrastructure. And similarly, if you ever, you know, if, you're, if you've been around a while and I have the white hair to have been around a while, um, you just uploaded your script onto an Apache server and you put in the CGI bin directory and like, you didn't worry about scaling because um, at that time the web was just not that big and you didn't have to worry about scaling. Um, nowadays, we live in a world where the web is a lot bigger and our machines, uh, a single thread won't do it. So we need to be able to scale out horizontally. But, you know, it should feel, it should feel as good as CGI bin did. And CGI bin was, you know, it was not bad. Like, there were some warts. We can do better. But it, it was, you know, it was simple and easy to figure out. Um, and so, uh, yeah. this, is, this is what some of these decompositions look like if you do them each separately. So um, I don't have a great example of a system that takes your source code and handles an event but doesn't give you a runtime for it. Um, I'd love if some of you have like, hey, actually I recognize a system like that to talk about it afterwards. Um, but, uh, you know, hey, we can build your code to handle a, an event and we can route your events, but we don't run it yourself. We don't have a great example of that. Um, yeah. He's got a little bit mixed up. So you wanna talk yeah, about I serving only? Yeah, we messed up the order of our slides. But with just serving alone, you just, it runs a container for you. You don't need to worry about how to run the container on Kubernetes and you get easy connections. So like Heroku, it gives you a URL right away. Um, unlike in Kubernetes where you need to make your deployment and your service and all these different resources with the labels lining up to get your endpoints to work. Uh, and it has all that scaling built in. So you don't need to attach an HPA or a VPA onto your deployment. Um, and so it makes a really nice experience to just run your code and not worry about anything else. And so there's some similar services, I guess. Uh, I haven't worked with these myself, but there's Google App Engine Flexible and AWS App Runner. And then there's just the eventing component, which is just how do you route events? So I've got some data running through my system and I wanna send them given different conditions to the right event consumer. And so 
this makes it declarative. You can declare on these conditions on my events, wrote it over here, and then that's the experience of just the eventing building block. And there's a lot of equivalent services like AWS Event Bridge or Azure Event Hub or Google Event Arc. They seem to stick event and then some other word after it. But um, it turns out event routing is really useful, but everyone does it their own special way, and they've got their own secret sauce. Um, and Knative eventing gives you kind of a common way to express it, and then you can underneath plug in Kafka or RabbitMQ or something like that. So that was one of the big pieces of feedback we got from Joe, actually, um, was you need to make sure that these things are pluggable so that people can bring in their, you know, they're a Kafka shop, and they're like, oh, well, we can't use Knative eventing because you only use RabbitMQ or you only use Nats or something like that. It needs to be able to take the environment that it's in there and you can pick out like, oh, we are a shop X and we can still use these eventing patterns even though um, you know, they were developed at shop Y that uses a different transport underneath. Yeah, and then the next building block and the third kind of individual building block was built, originally called Knative Build. That spun out into Tecton and I think we'll talk about that more as we talk about how the project evolved, but now there's Knative Functions. And the key characteristic there is you shouldn't have to worry about how do you get a container from your code. You should be able to just say, here's my code, give me a container somehow, and maybe even deploy it into my system for me. And so CNCF Build Packs is another project that handles kind of the no, don't give me a Docker file, just build my code experience. Um, um, I'm also going to mention Jib and Co are a couple of Go and Java specific tools that do the same type of thing. Um, Build Packs is nice because it handles many different languages as opposed to lock, you know, saying, oh, well, you can only do this nice experience with Go, or you can only do this nice experience with Java. Um, and then the original combination that we had working was basically a container plus deliver events to it. Um, Apache OpenWhisk was a little bit similar to that, but that's kind of all the different ways that you could mix these things up and just use different pieces without putting the whole thing together. Um, and if we actually go back to talking about eventing uh, eventing only, you can route the events to a VM or you can route the events to some other service. And um, yeah, you know, anything with that the can URL. be that can be handy to just have the events without necessarily needing to feed everything into Knative. Um, and so now Colin's going to talk a bunch about what does it mean to have these components, and then we'll go through a bunch of how did we do against these you know against these criteria um, after that. Yeah. I'll just stop over here for yeah, a minute. Yeah, I'll let you. Um, so, see we're basically going to go through each of the components one at a time and look at what were some of the main requirements we care about for you know, serving and then eventing and then build. So, first of all, for serving, the three biggest requirements were seamless, fast scaling, all the way down to zero and then up to as large as you need, um, the simple developer experience that you're getting with Lambda and Heroku, and then a lot of different controls over how everything works. So one of the experiences uh, when we originally started writing the Knative uh, serving spec was we wrote something that was nice and simple and worked well for the Heroku style experience. And one of the engineers on the Google App Engine team looked at it and said, well, but that's not going to work for our biggest customer. You know, we need an API that also works for them. And so uh, we were like, great, we just spent three weeks agreeing on an API, tear it all up, and let's start again and see if we can keep a lot of the simplicity while also accommodating you know, a customer who has millions of requests per second and need for you know, multiple fine-grained traffic you know, splits and rollouts and things like that. And I think we succeeded at that, um, but those full-featured controls meant that you didn't have to graduate off of the platform the way that some people sometimes had to graduate off of Heroku. Yeah, that way, you know, you can start as simple as you want and then start opting into the more advanced controls as you need them. So diving more into these requirements, we'll start with that scaling. So first of all, the scaling had to be fast enough that users won't quit your app while you're waiting for the request. So if the scaling takes 10 seconds, most users would just leave your application and never visit the website. So it had to be on the time scale of a few seconds in the worst case for your average web app. Um, nowadays, with people putting like huge Gen AI models into surfing, I think that a few seconds would be a little miraculous. Yeah. But back depends then, on how your caching works. I guess, yeah. Back then, if you're looking at just a website or web app, um, you know, you're really looking at fast enough for that use case. 
And then also another key requirement is instead of going from zero to one fast enough, it should be able to get to a huge scale, basically whatever scale you could achieve in that Kubernetes cluster without Knative. Um, like Knative should be able to get you up to that scale. And for all of the scaling, Knative shouldn't drop any of your requests. Users should just be able to interact like your website like it's any other website and never know that it's Knative under the hood. Job zero is to be invisible. <laughs> yeah. And then for the simple developer experience, um, we didn't want app developers to have to actually learn the complexities of the underlying Kubernetes infrastructure. You should be able to just learn how Knative serving works, and that should be all you need to know. And so you should be able to say, hey, Knative, here's where my container is. Maybe here's the port that my container exposes, which as an app developer, you normally know at least that much. And then, Usually. hopefully. <laughs> Um, and then Knative should be able to do the rest at that simple end before you start opting into the fancier features. And then you should also get a URL for each of your services without any extra work. So if you remember before, and if most people here have probably done it before, there's a lot of different resources you have to create in Kubernetes before you get to the point of having a URL that you can expose to the public internet, for example. Oh, you also don't get a URL until you set up DNS. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you maybe not be able to do on your own. So you really want the system to be able to get the DNS lined up for you as well. Yeah, and then another thing about this whole simpler experience is we didn't want to force users to adopt a specific language or runtime. So if you think about many kind of function as a service things, there's a specific runtime that you're using, which you have to import. And Knative Serving should just work with any container, which means any language as well. And the best way to sum it up is it should just work for anything that receives HTTP, and you shouldn't have to worry about it. If you, if you have an Nginx static container, then like, that should just go. And then going on, so going beyond that simple experience into the full featured controls, there's um, a lot of different features you might want in terms of revisions and traffic management. Um, but the first criteria to all this fancier features is that it should still be forgiving and easy if you're not an expert in all these topics. And so, you know, I should automatically create named revisions whenever you change it. You shouldn't have to learn how all those work and do it yourself. Or, you know, l learn about rollbacks only the first time you need them. You know, hopefully it's already there and ready for you, rather than you're like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, and I guess that's... And, and if you've ever tried to roll back a Kubernetes deployment, there's a lot of documentation to read about what you're doing. <laughs> Exactly, and that ties nicely to our next point, making it easy to roll forwards and back by changing your traffic amounts. So as many people know, your Knative service, you have different revisions, and you can basically specify what percentage of the traffic should go to these different revisions. And so if Knative's automatically creating those revisions for you as you make changes, then you can just assign 100% traffic to an earlier revision if you need to roll back, and you don't have to worry about, uh-oh, did I have a revision back then? It's just there, and you can put the traffic onto it. Um, and finally, you shouldn't need a separate project to manage everything. You should be able to do all this traffic splitting and revision management within Knative instead of some external rollback system or yep. something like that. So those are the key requirements for serving. So let's move on to eventing. And so the, some of the main requirements for eventing was you should be able to give different delivery semantics and guarantees to the user from the system. Um, it should completely decouple the event producers from the event consumers as much as possible. And it should be able to do asynchronous delivery of these events at a large scale. So on the topic of delivery semantics and guarantees, we wanted to make sure that the envelope for this different data that's being delivered was standard. We didn't want to come up with our own Knative specific event thing. And so everyone's we seen the XKCD. You know, there were 14 competing standards. We went to fix it. Now there are 15. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this lesson was learned, but we tried. Um, and we really wanted people to be able to understand, like, this is the contract you have to follow. Like, you know, it's consistent no matter which underlying transport you use. We'll bring you up to some kind of common bar, and if something doesn't fit that, then, you know, it'll have to lift up a little bit. If something is, you know, above that, that's great. Maybe you get extra functionality. But you get at least a minimum bar that lets you design useful applications. Yeah, and one of the cool things now about using the standard cloud events envelope is more and more services are starting to adopt cloud events support. So back in April or May, AWS EventBridge announced support for sending and receiving cloud events. So now if you want to have a like, hybrid two-part event system, you can send events from Knative Eventing into EventBridge, all speaking cloud events. Yeah. 
Um, the next one was we wanted to make sure that there's you know, your normal delivery semantics of at least once delivery. So if you send an event into KNA of eventing, it should send it to all the consumers who care about it at least once. Um, exactly once de delivery semantics are pretty complicated and normally we involve code on the consumer side as well. So KNA of eventing said we'll get it there at least once. Um, I'm just going to cut in for oh, a yeah. moment. We're, we're running slightly behind our slide schedule. We'll go faster. So yeah, we'll let some people read some of those. <laughs> yeah, um, basically chain event handlers, um, and the producer should just know if the event was delivered or not. That's an important one. Um, and then users should be able to specify what happens when the delivery fails for the event. Um, the biggest thing for eventing is it should let the producers um, not need to be aware of who's consuming the events, and the consumers shouldn't need to know who's actually sending them the events. And so having the event-driven components in the middle should let you decouple your different containers you're running. I'm just going to cut in real quick there with a example um, that was talked about early on from the insurance industry, where you have a CRM system where customers go and update their addresses. But if a customer updates their address and they've moved, you may need to requote their insurance. And you don't want the insurance quoting system to have dependency on the CRM system and the CRM system to also be calling the insurance quoting system, you get a weird cycle in your architecture and architects hate those cycles. So eventing lets you say, oh, I put this onto the event bus and then I don't know what happened to it, it's fine. And the event bus then kind of sits at the bottom of your architecture and it gives you an out from some of those cycles. Yeah, and the other really nice feature of that is you can just add another consumer whenever you want. Yeah. You don't need to re-architect the producer or change any code. You just add more consumers. Or you can remove the consumer. Yeah, or the producer. Yeah. Um, the final one was just similar to serving. This should all work at scale. And so you don't really want eventing to be a huge bottleneck in your system. Um, we want to use existing battle-tested message routing systems like RabbitMQ or Kafka to do all of this message delivery. Um, it should be able to handle failure or overload or back pressure. And the clients shouldn't need to do special things to ha handle producing or consuming these events at scale. It should just work. So the final component that we had some requirements for was build at the time and now it's functions. The first main requirement was you should be able to just give it some source code and get an executable out. Um, sounds easy. Yeah. <laughs> if you've never run a build system, it sounds real easy. <laughs> So specifically, um, for functions, for example, you might need to wrap your source code into a framework to set up all the HTTP listing and stuff. And then we want to be able to build either just from some local source code or a remote repository reference. And it should just work regardless of what language you're using. So the build system shouldn't force you to use Java or Go or C++. It should work. Um, in terms of the build definition, it should be simple, but you should be able to repeat it, and it should be declarative. You shouldn't have to imperatively say, do this first step, and then the second step, you should be able to say what I want to get out of this system. Um, you should be able to reuse them between your different projects, so that if you figure it out once, you can just port it over. And it should be really easy to move from building locally and testing locally to using this on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and finally, anything that's building containers should be able to push the containers to a container registry and hopefully deploy it into a cluster as well. I mean, the, the observation here was simply that, hey, Kubernetes uses containers as the basic way of handling things. We should be native to that and we shouldn't have like, you know, Heroku has dynos and that's their native thing, but bringing dynos to Kubernetes would be weird and ignoring all the stuff, all the other tooling. We should work nicely with all those other tools. Yeah, so now that we've kind of seen what these requirements for these different points, I think it's worth asking how well did we actually achieve these requirements. I'm going to pass it back to Evan, who can take us through some of the history of the project. Yeah, so um, we're going we're gonna to wind, wind all the way back to the beginning. And I apologize for the traffic lights. I couldn't quite figure out how to express this well. And so you can see that I did traffic lights with gradations, which um, if you're a traffic engineer, you're probably screaming at me right now. But um, 0.1, we didn't actually manage to package eventing. Um, serving installation was about 500K of YAML. Uh, it took Joe Beta two TGIK episodes of two hours each to decide that he'd seen enough YAML and was just going to try installing this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, build was kind of there, but if we wind forward to the next year, build is gone. Build went away. Build grew up and realized that they could build things that weren't just containers for 
serverless, but they could build containers for other things, and they could build things that weren't containers, and they graduated to become Tecton, um, which was great for them and meant that for the next several slides, we'll have kind of a blank where build is. Um, the initial Knative 0.1 packaged Istio because we were like, well, you need an Istio in order to be able to make things work. Let's bundle it up into the YAML that you install. Uh, we got a lot of feedback on that. Um, a lot of people weren't ready to adopt Istio. Istio, the first version that we installed, um, failed closed, which is kind of a fun experience. You install Istio on your cluster, and then everything that was working for talking to each other doesn't work until you figure out how to open things up again. They changed that in Istio 1.1 or 1.2, um, but we'd also heard that a lot of people weren't ready to install Istio, and so we defined what does it look like to give you a nice ingress that we could use with Knative? And then we started building adapters for things like Contour and Ambassador. And eventually, Gateway API has come along and has kind of redone a lot of that work. Dave had a great talk about Gateway API yesterday. Um, one of the things we really wanted was the ability to know when is the programming done? When can you expect to not get a 400 or a 500 when you try to reach this thing? Um, and a lot of those frameworks didn't build that natively, and so we built a lot of that infrastructure ourselves. So now I'm gonna wind us another year or so forward, a little bit more than that. Um, and uh, serving has a V1 API, eventing has most of a V1 API, has figured out a lot of those pieces, and um, Kafka and RabbitMQ and Nats all are providers there um, for routing. And we figured out a lot of that event model. And build is still MIA. We haven't figured out what to do about the fact that, you know, building a container is hard and there's no easy mode. We just say, assume that you could build a container. Um, also, we've been furiously dealing with the fact that Knative was not part of the CNCF and it was owned by Google. And trying to work through a bunch of governance things. And one of the governance things was, who gets to extend the core Knative APIs, and how do we work together on stuff that's not core? And so we built this extensions organi organization, and we now have something like 100 repos. At the time, we had about 60. Um, and you can see some of the reports that we did, you know, like 140 releases in a year um, across all the repos and a six, every six-week release process. So we got real good at releases. Um, if you want to get good at releases, I recommend doing them often. Um, so November 2021, uh, we've decided that we've hit a 1.0. Um, serving and eventing are both V1. They've hit test coverage targets and documentation targets and a bunch of other things that um, you know, mean that they really work for real people as opposed to just they work when the developer's working on them. Um, and Red Hat was just offering this funk build project to build functions into containers. And we were looking at it, we're like, yeah, let's try it, but we're not sure that's a core interface yet. Um, and so we had a big celebration on all the good stuff. Um, and then I'm going to fast forward another year because the celebration was fun, the cake was yummy, and it's gone now. No more cake. Um, so Functions has reached its GA. Um, around this time, Google decided that they were happy to cooperate with the CNCF and start the donation process. Uh, I forgot to mention that in here. Um, but, you know, functions is a real thing. We've gone back from the dark days of there's no build to, hey, actually, we can take your code. It's a little bit hot off the press, but we can turn it into a container and we can run it on Knative. Um, uh, we also, around this time, started talking about changing our release cadence. Uh, we uh, got some feedback that, you know, hey, great, you were rolling out new features every six weeks. It was great to get the new features fresh off the tap. And now you're, part of your focus is stability. And maybe we don't have to upgrade every six weeks, please. Um, and so we talked about it. Uh, we moved to a quarterly cadence. I did some fun stuff where I uh, wrote a doc about it and actually calendared out all the different holidays that we might have to work around. And we have a cron that cron pattern that says, this is when the release day is, it will hit the fewest holidays if you want to do it quarterly. And if anyone's curious, um, it's in our public repo. And if you want to do you know, a different interval, you can figure out what your fewest holidays are. 
Uh, Easter is super hard, by the way. That's like six weeks of holiday that you don't know when it is because it's lunar calendar. Um, oh, and Eastern Orthodox is different than, it was fun. Um, so we're gonna skip forward another eight, you know, dot eight releases, which is a bigger gap. Um, you'll notice that this was November to October, and now we got almost two years forward. Um, and I'm gonna hand these things over to Callum because Callum showed up around 1.8 and he's experienced a lot of this life since and has driven some of this stuff. Yeah, I guess specifically this slide was the main thing I drove, but one of the things that um, happened at this point was there's all these different parts of Knative that had all evolved semi-independently, like serving was doing its own thing, eventing was doing its own thing, functions was doing its own thing, and they all work really well together, but they're different groups, different people. And so coming into the project later, um, there was, I felt a lack of great user experience of learning how to use all these things or interacting with the website. If it turns out, it turns out if you have three teams and you ask them each to write documentation, they write documentation for their one thing, and a user shows up and they're like, I don't get the whole thing. Or even why not use which part. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I was able to do is I knew a lot of designers at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. Um, it's a bit of a funny story why it's both a college and a university, uh, but I don't think we have time for that today. But we managed to start a UX working group that had UX designers participating in it instead of just engineers trying to figure out this UX design stuff. And they managed to redesign the documentation onboarding flow, and we got this great new mascot called Quack, who you've seen on some of the slides. And hopefully we can get some stickers in the future. I also want to call out something that I've seen elsewhere uh, as an anti-pattern of technical and non-technical contributions. Uh, we should really talk about coding and non-coding contributions when we do that, because what these designers do is very technical. I don't understand how to do it, but there's clearly a lot of technique and understanding and, and patterns involved. And so we should really, when we talk about you know, contributions, rather than saying technical and non-technical, we should really say coding or software and non-software, because um, I highly recommend if you can find some of these people, superpowers, because uh, they look at the world a different way. Yeah, and they, like, they managed to do this cool exercise at KubeCon, which let us restructure our whole documentation, and it's been really cool so far. Um, and they were like, hey, you need a mascot, and they did that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also been new authorization being built into eventing, where you get TLS and OIDC, and you can say which service accounts are allowed to send events to which resources, and so you get all the normal security authorization stuff you'd expect in 2024 out of eventing. Um, so eventing is, is a little bit, asynchronous stuff in general is a little bit funny because you're like, here's this thing, it gets stored, um, and then like at some point later, someone else gets to pick it up and see it, and you don't really get to know where all that message goes, unlike gRPC or something like that, where you can just check the other end. So um, building all of that authorization and figuring out, well, who do I check and at what points um, was an interesting process. And, and also, what should, I think we ended up in a good place. But yeah, and like what should be the API for defining who's allowed to send stuff was interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you can just pick any deliverable, and they can say, here's the audiences I expect, and then venting checks that all for you. And and you can say, hey, you know, I'm getting a customer, you know, address updated event, and it's coming from the customer retention namespace. Well, that sounds great. Uh, it's coming from the billing namespace. Why are they doing anything about customer information? You know, maybe we need to go and block that event and look at what's going on. Um, and what's up next? We are in the queue for graduation. Um, we are looking, I've run into a number of people, but we're looking for people who are interested in being interviewed for our graduation process. Um, if you are a KNAV user, add yourself to our doctor's file in the community repo, or you know, come talk to myself or Callum. I see Dave and some other folks over there, um, and we'll help get you in. And if you want, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you and say nice things about you if you're using KNative. So um, that's part of our next, next phase of life. And I guess just while we're on that topic, if anyone else is interested in contributing to Knative, we're always looking for more contributors. Yeah. Whether it's code contributions or non-code contributions, as we talked about, we have a very robust UX working group now where you can also participate if you are interested, but maybe writing code isn't your thing. 
and here's where you can find us. There's yep. CNCF Slack, lots of Knative channels. Then there's a new great set of tutorials where you build a whole end-to-end -end application. And, and we were just talking about extending that earlier to yeah. give further examples of chaining events together um, to do like a pipeline. It's a bookstore, and your book delivery and so forth would be part of that pipeline. Yeah. I think we're out of time now, but that's yep. kind of how Knative started and how it's gotten to where it is now. And I'm excited to see what the future is for the project. Yeah. Thank you.